This evening we have Sudhir Patwardhan ji, famous contemporary painter and writer, who will be talking to us about the city that we live in through his paintings. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Sudhir ji. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, friends. Thanks for being here. The title of the presentation or the talk that has been given is the inside-outside paradox. This sounds a bit uh, like serious and uh, scientific or, I don't know, mathematical. It's not going to be all that difficult. Uh, the basic simple uh, idea behind the two inside and outside that I come to is being inside a built space like this, being inside a home, being inside a cafe, being inside a shop or being inside some enclosed space and being outside, that's in the street, out in the street or in a more open space. So it's between these two spaces, between being inside something and being outside something, that my work has in fact evolved. And I'll try to, starting with the very simple uh, kind of ways in which it is reflected in my work, I'll try to develop this inside outside duality or whatever paradox into a more complex areas that also kind of reflect in the work. To give a little background uh, of where my work comes from, I came to the city of Bombay in 1974. Since then, from my first encounter with the city, uh, the city has been the primary subject matter moves for my work. So I've been painting the city for over 40 years. And just to give you an example of two works that are both of Vikroli, around Vikroli, around the Godrich factory. And the one on your left is done in 1977, while the one on your right is done in 19, sorry, 2016. So a lot of time lag between them. Lots of things have changed. Some things remain. So that is where, that is what my work primarily addresses, the city of Bombay and the experience of being in the city of Bombay. As we all would agree, the city of Bombay is a city of contrasts. Rich, poor, high, low, and all other contrasts. We hate the contrasts. We hate that there are so many contrasts. But we also respond to them, and we, in fact, probably love the contrasts as well. That is what gives the city a certain character. The special thing about this character is that the contrasts are obvious and you can see them, you can experience them in every part of the city. There are no areas that are coroned off as belonging to or as areas where a common man is not welcome and there are not areas where the biggest Mercedes Benz or whichever car can't go. It can go into Dharavi, it can go wherever else it wishes. So there are no boundary walls in the city of Bombay. All the contrasts are there open for all of us to see. And this is an aspect of the city in spite of the fact that one hates and one wishes that there were not such great contrasts in living standards and things like that. But this is an aspect of the city which gives it a certain character which we like. 
This is a character which, to my mind, in recent years, seems to be in some kind of threat. There seems to be a growing tendency in the city to wall off spaces, have gated kind of areas. And this one fears may rob the city of its essential character. But that apart, this is not a very old painting. It's from 2012. And as a I just brought it here to show you one aspect of the contrasts. Another aspect just outside, if you walk on to the bridge, if you go on to the bridge outside, we know the way in which the whole mill area has been changing over the last 15, 20 years. Another aspect of those contrasts, a lot of injustice having been done there. A lot, of, a lot of decisions taken against the benefit or against the wish of the people in general and for, for a few people, for a certain builder lobby and for certain mill owners. So Charles Correa had a plan and his team had a lovely plan, a beautiful plan to develop this central area, mill area of Bombay, which will benefit all its citizens and which will make the city of Bombay a, a more livable city. But unfortunately, that did not happen. And now we are faced with the kind of uh, traffic and the kind of uh, whatever in the city, in, in the center of the city. That much for the background of what my basic concern, what my subject matter has been. This is an old painting from 1977 again of the Irani restaurant. I show it here with the specific intention to show you that the inside and outside always interpenetrate sitting inside the cafe, but the street outside is reflected in the mirror. There are people who are walking in and walking out. So for any experience of the street of Bombay, the inside and outside are always, in a sense, they are not two compartments. They are not water watertight compartments. They are interpenetrating each other. Similarly, another old painting from 1980 called The City. And again here, a cafe. That is a period when I was painting the streets at street level, painting cafes, restaurants, railway platforms, and generally street scenes. So here again, you see the inside and outside, side by side, the bus on the outside. So it all becomes, in a sense, one space. You do not experience them as separate spaces, though there is an element in the experience which makes these two spaces, being inside and being outside. Another painting from the early 80s, during the mill strike. So here again, there, are, there were the mill walls and there was the inside of the mills, which very few of us had experienced, but which we all read about, thought about. And there were people outside who were recreating, in a sense, the conditions of the mill workers and things like that in street plays in the fort area. So there is a street, there is an outside there. There is a mill with a wall with an inside to it, which we only imagine. You see the workers coming out. And then there is the bus that is passing that is reflected in a shop door or something, and which, in which you see people. So again, this idea that all through one's experience of the city, 
there are aspects of inside and aspects of outside that are always interacting with each other, interpenetrating each other. Yeah, so as I was saying, every experience in the city is in that way an experience of simultaneity between the inside and the outside. You're standing on a railway platform, you're looking into the bogey, you're seeing people inside, you're spe seeing people outside, people wanting to get in from outside, people wanting to get out from inside. So this is what we live with all the time. This is another painting from the early 80s, another one from early 80s. All the paintings are not chronologically arranged, but this lot is in fact the early work. Accident on May Day. I show it again because in it, for some reason, two spaces, very distinct spaces got formulated. One is, of course, on your right, which is the inside, the overcrowded compartment inside when workers are going to a morcha for the May Day rally coming to Azad Maidan, which no longer happens now. There are other morchas, of course. And then there's that gap between two bogies which shows us an open, opening out, which shows us a landscape in the far distance. So again, for an artist to bring together spaces like that has a special attraction, has a special, because you're playing with perspective, you're playing with, uh, with uh, the way in which space is perceived. So this again, is about that. Then in 78, uh, after having stayed in South Bombay, in Girgaon, and in Tardev, etc., for five years, we moved to Thane. Uh, and at that time, Thane did afford much more open spaces. It, it was a different landscape around us. So that started to become reflected in my work, this is a painting called Town from 84. But you will observe that even though this is essentially a painting of the outside, in the sense that it's a painting of open spaces, though right in front in the foreground is something that's being built. So ultimately this is a space that is going to become enclosed and behind it are windows, the buildings with windows through which you are peeping into an inside space. So that same preoccupation continues. Here again in a painting called Nalla from 85. I'd like to draw your attention to that half-built RCC structure and the inside of that, the bottom of the first floor, let's say. The way in which that is reflected the way in which you look at that and the way in which you look at the rest of the landscape. So here, there is a movement from bottom to top that takes you along, which is similar to an Indian miniature, which takes you from the bottom, is the foreground, up to the distant bank background. But there is a contrary movement in that building that's up front, that's being built where you are in fact being sucked in, into something rather than flowing upward. So this is a kind of perspectival contrast that one started to build to highlight this existence of dual spaces and dual ways of experiencing our environment. Tana also had begun to change when we went and within 10 years of after moving to Thana from the mid 80s, it began to change in a big way. Housing began to replace all the industries that were there and they started to dig up hills as many of you may have, as many, many of you may have experienced in Pawai, across Pawai Lake, at one time across IIT, there were lovely hills. Slowly, they were completely replaced by what today exists there. Many of us stay in that area, so we can't complain, but even then. So this, this kind of outside and 
here there is an inside of the earth itself that is being exposed. So here there is an outside that's being built and an inside, another kind of, here it becomes even more clear that there is now a big hole, a black hole, which will suck in all that is around it, in a sense. This is an image of the area called Pokhran in Thana, where we often went for a ride or a walk or whatever. So the painting itself, to say a little bit about it, is built, is, is structured somewhat as Chinese landscape painting is structured. The Chinese landscape painter goes for a walk in the landscape. He roams about, he collects his impressions of various parts of the landscape. He comes back and then he will structure it into one image. Similarly, in this image, you will see that the direction of the sun on the left side and the direction of the sun on the right side is different. So it implies that a person is walking along first up the hill and he reaches up the hill and then looks back, changing his direction. So that's a kind of way of structuring landscape, not as a view seen just from one point, but as a participation, as a participant in that landscape, walking through that landscape. And as I said, that big black hole in the center. Another example of that hole in the center, another image of Kanjur Marg. There's a lovely hill there, which is now covered more. I mean, the, the, the kind of huts that have now moved higher up. And you see the structures, the structures which uh, kind of come to the center of something and then. So this, this is another kind of, I think the inside here is less physical in a sense and more a kind of psychological or a mental thing. That one is imagining that there is, with these hills disappearing, with nature kind of being eroded, there is a hole somewhere that's being dug into, when it's being dug into nature or in your surroundings, it's also being simultaneously dug within yourself. So there is a slight sense, slight implication, a kind of allegory too and a different kind of insight. Another image from Thana. Now, the inside and outside all exist simultaneously, as we said, of course. But there is also movement. Our eyes move. And in this case, our eyes move from the outside from the sunny surface of the building into someone's house, into a room. And one focuses then into the woman who is probably serving breakfast or something uh, or making something on, on her table there. So there is this movement from the outside to the inside. Our eyes move continuously as we walk along a street, as we walk Shops, of course, we are continuously looking into, but also into people's homes, or when we travel by train or by bus, especially at night, we are always peeping into people's homes. Like this, for example. So the inside becomes revealed in a different way at night. The inside of homes, the inside of buildings, the inside of restaurants, cafes, the outside becomes sort of blank. You don't notice, you don't notice the street on which you're walking. You notice the shops and the cafes and the houses. So you're continuously traveling, your eye is traveling from the inside, uh, sorry, from the outside into something. This is a painting called Street Corner. Lots of things happening in different parts of the painting. You'll notice a music class going up on the first floor. Another one who's probably had some kind of surgery on his skull. 
and of course people returning from their shift, couple riding, a woman making chapatis, all that. And it takes you more and more inside as you go into the house to that old woman who's climbing up for probably the steps on the back of the house. At a certain point, this, this being in the city, roaming the city, being inside your home, being outside, being in someone else's home, etc., etc., traveling by train, bus, whatever, and looking in, at, at a certain stage, that threshold itself acquires uh, 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 a certain meaning for you, the, thre the threshold of the window. So this, at, at a certain stage, you start becoming conscious that there is something that separates, that can separate you from the city. You can be inside your own home, you can be inside something, and you can look at the city from a window. The city is contained. The city, the, a fragment of the city is all that you will see. You're not exposing yourself to life in the street fully. You're not exposing, you're not embracing the city in that sense, but you're allowing only a fragment of the city to be part of that experience. So the threshold, the window, then at that stage acquires a certain kind of importance. Now, whether one wants at this point to get out, whether the home is restrictive, whether the home is oppressive, whether the home is, does not have enough fresh air, and whether one wants to get out, or whether one is wanting to get into the security of the home, wanting to get away from what is outside, this, this becomes like an open question. Sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that. Sometimes you want to get out into the city, sometimes you want to protect yourself and get back home or get back into enclosed spaces. So that, that play and the window here then becomes a kind of uh, metaphor for what separates you, what separates a larger experience of the city from your more private experience of the home. A few images of just the window, how the window itself, the threshold of the window itself becomes point blank in some senses. In earlier structures, you have balconies and earlier buildings that were being built. Yes. So you had that one painting where people were, the earlier one with the two women, <coughs> no, with the man inside the house, the first inside picture you showed, this no, one? before that. Yeah. See? Yes. So he's at a window yes. and you're looking straight out there. Yes at somebody at a balcony, which you see often in the older parts of Bombay. Absolutely, yeah. And even earlier pictures you've showed of guys hanging out of balconies in That's a way right. where the city doesn't get cut off in quite the same way. Yes. And it seems to me that structurally, uh, the balcony is disappearing more and more, right? Even Ab though people are pulling the balcony into their houses. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's a very important observation. That the way in which we actually live, the, you know, the openness with which every family interacts with their neighbors or with others or with the street has changed, definitely. One of it may be simple uh, space constrictions. You know, you just want more space. But then that has changed. And you're very right in pointing out that now fewer and fewer balconies exist. There's more kind of cut off, you know, between the home and the outside. One wants to observe the street. One, one will always want to observe the street. And one sees many, many people either at their balcony or at their window, sitting in the evening, wherever it's possible. And one sees many old people doing this and just observing life on the street go past. You know? So that's one of the great pleasures of Bombay. But it also has a certain kind of sadness about it. that It's these people who are now no longer part of something, mostly, who are now trying to connect. This brings us to certain questions of representation as an artist, 
I mean, as an artist, when one is painting this, and one is painting insides and outsides, painting the experience of being inside a home and outside a home, then the artist is kind of uh, faced with certain things and actually painting an inside with a window outside that is looking up on the outside affords him to formulate certain questions about representation. So here is a painting called The Abstractionist. Now, you know that an artist does not represent exactly what he sees. He transforms what he sees in certain ways to make a, a, a convincing or a believable painting. And, and that transformation contains certain abstraction. He has to abstract from reality. He has to simplify it or he has to structure it, restructure it in various ways. So here is a person who's probably a painter looking at a drawing of his, which is an abstract drawing. But the world outside, now in this representation of the buildings outside, I have already imposed one level of abstraction. The buildings would normally, a photograph of the buildings would normally have, for one thing, they would be much more dirty, and then they would have stains, they would have other things, they would have things sticking out, etc., etc., etc. All that has minimalized. I've minimalized that to make it a kind of pattern out of the window. Beyond that, the way in which it is that those same buildings are reflected in the uh, glass panes of the bookcase is a further level of abstraction from the same image and then ultimately is his drawing which is a completely abstract drawing. So this is what the artist is actually dealing with, how to abstract something from reality. So here the question of inside and outside has changed color. Here the question is not just of the outside and being inside the house, it's how to turn the outer world into art. So here art becomes the inside and the outer world is being transformed in some way into another work of the same series. It's called Studio Ghosts, but nothing to be scared of. It's just that every artist, when he's painting alone in his studio, is all the time visited by many presences. People you know, his friends, his family. So they are all there around him. Their presence is all there around him. And apart from this, here he is painting. This on your left is a painting. And what you see, that is a window. That's, well, that's supposed to be a window, let's say. But what you see outside the window is a much more abstract, abstracted landscape than what you see in the painting. The painting is much more convincing as if it is a real thing. So this go between, between art and life, or between reality and representation, is something that, as I said, this allows this kind of painting where I'm painting the inside and outside in, from the studio, allows me to meditate on this question of the inside and outside in a sort of deeper level. Which one? <laughs> well, yeah, that's one of the ghosts. That's my, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's memory of my mother sitting there who would, I imagine, observe me painting or think about me. And this very strange, I don't know if it, because it's, it's not it's meant to be convincing in that way, but these hills at the bottom that you see, uh, on the right, you know, those pattern of hills. Actually, uh, it is a pattern of hills, but it also reminds me, it, it is there because it reminds me of my father sleeping with a chadar, you know. So these are the people who will be there. There's another cousin who will be there to question what I'm doing. So these are the ghosts, yeah, they're very inside. Yeah, so this is another painting called Difficulty in Telling the Truth. It's about self-portraiture. The man, the artist with his back to us, has painted the painting that is in front, 
which is a self-portrait of himself. You can see that there is, within that painting, there is a painting. And there is a window in that painting that is painted. And it is this window that is here on your left. That is what he has painted. Now, this is like a story within a story. There is a painting. Within the painting, there is another painting in which what you see in the painting number one is reproduced or reflected in painting number two. So this takes us to the question of like how many levels of representation, how many levels are there between reality and us? You know, we think of reality, we, we see something and we say, yeah, that is what I saw. But then that is what your eyes have seen, that is what your mind has read as what you saw, and so many other levels. So this is a kind of meditation on that kind of thing. There are more kind of complicated things in references, I would say. There is a book by a very well-known art historian, Gomrich, which is called Art and Illusion, which talks about this question. How, how does art tackle the question of illusion? Is all art only illusion, or does it actually refer to something that is real in the real world? So questions like that. So there are references in the painting to that sort of thing. Now, till now, those were earlier paintings. I will again show some other earlier ones. But this one is a recent painting, which is up in the show at Jahangir Art Gallery. It's called Compass. It's essentially an image of our home in Thana. I am seeing two rooms here, one with the dining table and then part of the living room and then the studio space on which there is a board and there is a paper and there's some drawings and things like that. And then there is the balcony and then there is the scene from outside. So my position or the viewer's position, not my position alone, but the viewer's position is such that at one point, he is looking from outside into the house, into one room, into another room. Then at some point, he goes out into the balcony, and he's looking out at the outside. But before that, he's also looking at the outside from within the space. So the vertical kind of uh, bars that you see are the frames of a sliding door. So this is a reconstruction of that space, as if one has moved around it. So here, the inside is not just one inside. Here there are multiple insides and there is outside. So this is a kind of structuring of, an ex of the experience of moving around one's own house. You go in, you go to the balcony, look out, then you come back. But when you come back, you also carry an image of what you have just seen. So things like that that happen with us. This is another painting at the at the exhibition on. This takes the question of viewer and the artist. What's the relationship between the viewer and the artist? So when you see an artist looking out of the painting, as in here, an artist is looking out, is he looking at us as viewers, is he looking at maybe something that he has painted on the canvas, which seems to be the surface, the way it's called erase. So he seems to be erasing something with that rag. So he's facing maybe a surface, which is a painted surface, and he has done something on it and he's erasing. But it's also almost our face that he's about to erase. So that's disturbing at one level. Then you realize that, OK, it, it probably be the artist's own face that he's re erasing. So it is this takes us to a kind of thing between within representations. You know, when you represent something, are you trying to get beyond it? When one draws, say, Cesar drew apples. He was not happy with, with in the way in which people painted still life. What was he trying to do? Was he trying to get closer to the apple? Was he trying to get the heart, the essence of the apple? Or was he trying to get 
closer to his language? Was he trying to get closer to ways of depicting? So this, this kind of duality or this kind of dichotomy between wanting to get closer to the world of objects and people on one hand and wanting to get closer to the language itself, to get a closer hold of the language itself. So these are the kinds of questions that crop up. This is called enigma and it kind of uh, encapsulates this problem in a way. You know the object itself, it's been popularized by the, uh, the graphic artist MCHR. So impossible objects. So basically their object, the, the drawing of such an object is extremely convincing. Yes, you know, if you have an engineering drawing like this, you can construct it in three dimensions. But you try to do that, and with these objects, you can't do it. These objects cannot exist. But they can be con convincingly depicted. So, in a sense, all representation is like that. You can do something, you can show something convincingly. You can describe something in language also, convincingly. But is that being convincing getting you to what is described? Or do you always remain within the language? So do you ever get out of language to what is described or what is shown? Or will you always remain within language? These are the kinds of questions that uh, objects like this throw up. Well, this is kind of again getting back to another inside-outside image. These problems that we just talk, talked about, representational problems, problems of what does language do? Does it, does it create an image of the world? Does it create a replica of the world? How does it do it? Is it an objective replica? Is it always a subjective replica? These things bring us to questions of, kind of psychological questions also of the artist. What for example, this is a painting called Family Fiction, and many of you will recognize the kind of reference to Pulp Fiction and things like that. But there is also Cesar, there is also some other painting there. There's some people sitting, seems like watching, this family, my family, which is watching a television set. So in your home, in the inside of your home, what are all the things from outside that can enter? So it's about that, art, film, whatever. All these things enter into. So will you say these have come from outside? Will you say these are outside influences? Or will you say that these are part of us? So things like that. More sinister things also like, you know, apparitions. You dream of something. So where does that come from? Do your dreams come from outside? They all look very convincing. You always refer to the outside world. But what is the relationship between those and your own inside? This is another painting from, those other paintings are not in this show. This is a painting from this show. So again, an image of a home. You see two or three rooms, three or uh, rooms and a passage. The inner room, as, as the painting is called, shows uh, some dead bodies, which refer to, a, to the image of a, a kind of room in which maybe there has been someone who has been nursed for a long time, maybe there has been death in that room, and then it will leave a certain kind of, uh, a certain kind of aura or a certain kind of presence. Uh, there. And then the, that will pervade the house in different ways. And also what pervades the house from the outside, as you see from your right, uh, what you see outside the right side window seems sinister. Uh, the, the face of the man who's watching the television 
also seems sinister. So what the kind of news or whatever he's hearing is from, from the outside is sinister. On the, on the other side is probably a, a little fresh breeze, which may be. But all these forces, the way in which they will, in fact, warp the space of the home. The home which is supposed to be in that way uh, a protection against the outside if we want to structure it in that way. Or something that protects you from the outside is all, is all the time kind of invaded by all these things. And so there is in no real sense an inside and outside division. Well, let's get away from uh, all those dark <laughs> Paintings for a bit. Uh, this is, yeah. So this is a large painting I did a uh, couple of years back. It's called Bombay Proverbs. It's seven panels. It's about Bombay. I was supposed to do a painting on Bombay. So it's called Bombay Proverbs and it from your left to right. It is a kind of uh, narrative of uh, the evolution of Bombay as a sen in a sense. So we start with colonial Bombay, though it's not a historical uh, kind of uh, image. It's what we see today. I mean, we go to Fort, you see colonial Bombay. And as you move to Paral, you see at one time what was mill, the mill area, which now has changed. Then you move ahead and you see all these high rises and things coming up in Dharavi, you see the, the metro and the, uh, the monorail going through. It's, it's quite a surreal, as, as talking to Samira, it's quite a surreal ride to get on at Ghatkopar and go towards Andheri and see these uh, huts on both sides. So this kind of ultra-modern technology within this. And then there are, of course, uh, the the industry that was there, which more or less now is out, but in some pockets there is still industry, which, uh, and I have it at the center of the painting because to my mind, to my old way of thinking, manufacture is really uh, the center of the economy. I mean, if there isn't manufacture, if there is only service, then probably that, I don't know, I'm not an economist, but that's my old way of thinking. So I put it at the center. And then there are, malls and air travel, which has now become so much part of our lives. So that is one kind of history. Then in the last two panels, there is on one side, I'll of course show you a little details of these, but there is uh, the kind of IT sector or the call centers and things like that, their air conditioned environment, but which obviously uh, has a kind of mechanized, uh, dehumanized look. And then beyond that, again, are the Jopatpattis and things like that. Uh, there are two kinds of, uh, we'll see in the detail, the two kinds of realities there. So these are the details. The first three panels. It's huge, yeah. It's the, each panel is seven and a half feet by four feet, so that makes it a seven and a half feet by 28 feet painting. It's, it hangs in uh, Mahendra's uh, office. These are the third, fourth, and fifth panel. and the last two panels. The two realities I was saying was like, in the last panel, up in the upper part, you see two turning torso kind of uh, Kaltrava's buildings, which we, I mean, we already have the biggest international architects building in Bombay. So that's a reality, kind of reality in, in one part. And then for the future, that's a little dark view of the future where there will be people who will be pushed below the surface even, will be forced to live. That's a kind of, that's, that's a well-known film, uh, apocalyptic film of people having to live under the ground. So that's uh, not all dark, but that's a vision of Bombay. 
Well, and the last painting is to my mind. I'm showing it because in this painting, this dichotomy, let's say at one level, what is inside, what is outside, or the tension between what is inside and what is outside, or the fact that there are two things, inside and outside, becomes resolved to my mind in some way. Happily resolved, let's say. So in my experience, it's called nostalgia. So obviously, I don't really believe that it will be resolved. But it's called nostalgia, and it is the home on one side, the inside, very much inside, where you're comfortable, where you're there, and the outside, which is not threatening, but which is part of your history, which, which comes from not just this city, but which comes where we came from. All of us came to this city from smaller towns, from villages, wherever, or our parents came, and things like that. So all that from the land as such, moving slowly, slowly into the city and into the home. So here there is a kind of much smoother, much more, let's say, uh, less disturbing flow from the outside to the inside. Thank you. you Question time. Yeah, just you'll have to wait for the mic. Yeah. So when you started out, did you always had this concept of inside and outside in your mind while you were painting this, or did you uh, like figured it out later while uh, seeing your work? Yeah, I, I I didn't have it when I started it out. Started out. It's it's something that has one has become conscious of that this is what one is doing. This is what one is addressing. So along the way, you know, and as I said, in more recent times, there has been a shift. Earlier, I saw myself essentially as a painter of the city. So I was painting what was outside, though what was inside came in, like looking into people's houses and things. But I slowly moved towards painting my own home or homes, family and things like that. And then the question of looking out at the city from a window or, you know, so that was a change in position. So it's, it's around that time that one became conscious that there is this. So I just want to thank you very much and say it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, you Nisthi. I just wanted to ask you about some of the early paintings uh, maybe the, the fourth or fifth one uh, makes me wonder whether there's a whole lot of cerebral activity that goes on even before you put uh, your brush to the canvas. For example, uh, in that particular painting, do you say I must have a, a factory so that I have, so I have a wall and there's a chimney there and there are people coming out? And then you say, okay, I must have the, yeah, I must have, a, you know, a, a person in an inside. So you have almost somebody sitting there at a table alone, almost in a sterilized setting. And then you say, okay, I must have a reflection of something. So there has to be a glass in which something outside is being reflected. Plus, I must have that outside thing itself there. So these are these four or five components. Now, is this a whole lot of cerebral activity that goes on? And then the, the thing is almost composed in your mind. And then you put it to canvas or it evolves as you paint. No, not at all. I mean, it doesn't, uh, it's not cerebral activity that takes place uh, prior to the actual work. It is the working out that in fact uh, goes, uh, and I wouldn't say even that it's, you cannot say that, that this is cerebral activity and this is uh, painterly activity. You know, when you're actually working, it is cerebral activity. So your actual process of working is a way of thinking. So one is thinking through uh, what one wants to do. And one can only get there by making mistakes, by making the wrong decisions, then correcting oneself, and things like that. So it's not predetermined uh, in any way. Yeah, please. Like, there was a painting in which you have made, like, as an artist, what is his representation? That he's sitting in a sofa seeing his painting and there's this yeah. thing outside. So, but, uh, like, 
what is the kind of emotion one gets when one is inside and what is the kind of emotion when it's outside so that thing if can be elaborated a little bit well, as i said there are times when you you're inside and you want to get out get the hell out of here you know <laughs> so for whatever reason you may be in a bad film you're watching a bad film you want to get out of, or whatever and there are times when like when it's raining heavily you want to get in somewhere that's a just a simple level but it can be either way so the inside is not associated as i said one might say inside security outside threat but then it can be interchanged you know the outside you want to get out because you want to be okay away from a threat inside or whatever so they interchangeable so there is nothing associated with the inside and outside per se no psychological or emotional color per se associated with this it is what you bring to it the need you bring to it you know of course generally you will say that it's much like open space gives you freedom but again the question of freedom for example an artist feels free when he is inside his studio you know so for an artist being inside is alone in his studio is being free and not being out necessarily so it varies it changes and one more question like you were describing about a master plan proposal which was given by korea and you like stopped in between if you can like elaborate a little bit on that as well well you must have read about it i don't yeah know. i have read but yeah. i want to know your perspective because you were present that time you have just read in books and yeah well there's very some very good books for example daryl de montos de montes book on uh, mumbai mill land for sale things like that which take you through the whole process of what happened so right from the 80s when the mills began to shut mid 80s there were committees put up there were the best architects and town planners of bombay who thought how this land which was getting freed could be utilized for the better of the city so they had a plan of one third one third one third which meant that one third would go to mill owners and builders one third would go for poor housing like you know housing for the poor and one third would go to city amenities like roads uh, hospitals schools and all that and infrastructure that was not acceptable to the mill owners the the committee reduced that to 50 okay you take 50 just give 50 out of which we'll divide it among these things that too was not acceptable and ultimately 95% of the land was handed over to mill owners and builders and the city did not get anything that is the reason we do not have wider roads in and between south bombay and the suburbs this is the area which is crucial to facilitate movement you know so we needed better uh, way better kind of uh, networking in these areas cross night none of that has happened because you know what so major reasons why the mill areas all the mill areas and it was a plan for integrated development of the mill areas so that not each mill developing on its own all the mills together had to be planned so there would be wonderful kind of i mean the it was a wonderful I, i'm not saying that the whole thing could have been 100% achieved but something could have been achieved but none of it was that's very sad for the city of bombay So, so in most of your paintings which i have observed uh, correct me if i'm yeah, correct me if i'm wrong so uh, your pers- point of view or uh, the perspective is above eye level or b- b- beyond human capacity like and some most of this time also seen the subject which is imagining is also in the picture and still the perspective of the subject has been represented so what is how do you mo- uh, come across this thought process like what is the motivation for this kind of representation what really motivated you when you were doing I don't know if that is entirely correct for all the paintings but you are some, right some of those yeah you are right that uh, probably a lot of them have a higher than eye level view to some extent it comes from an influence of miniature painting the way in which that structures work so there the horizon is always at the top of the painting so i think one can get much more narrative into the painting by doing that so that is one of the reasons uh i don't know 
uh, whether there are, I mean, there would probably be many other kind of considerations, but each time it's like, you know, there may be, I don't, I can't, I'm trying to imagine if there is, there is one painting that we showed a man lying on the floor, uh, which is like lower level and he's look, the window is up, but I think it would just be what I felt. Yeah. Yes. Uh, excuse me. It, this is not really only just on painting, but I'm. Most of your pictures I felt were a bit morbid. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel that Bombay is deteriorating to what its early things were? Do you think that uh, you know its changes, ways has changed to what it was maybe 15 years, 20 years ago? Yeah. You feel, I mean, that's what I'm feeling. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. I do. And, but I don't claim that uh, everyone need to agree with this. I think a, young, a younger generation probably uh, sees it in a different way. People who have not seen that. And we have a right to uh, have our own. I mean, we grew up in the 70s. I grew up in the sense I came here in the 70s and saw a certain kind of Bombay, identified with certain things. Irani restaurants, for example, I'll always feel sad that they're gone. You know? And that is one of the things that one will lament. I'm also but, Bombay Yeah. But so, yeah. <laughs> so, so one does feel sad I about a lot of things. Right. Yeah. 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 There's no claim to being objective here. But it's just right. that way. Right. Roshan? Can I just okay, after him. After him. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, just an addition. It's like an addition to what ma'am said. So when you said about, uh, when she was saying about the morbid figures, I was also trying to understand why you chose the word paradox, like the inside-outside paradox, because paradox as an idea seems like there are two contradictory things, like inside and outside. And it, it's like a vicious cycle. If you're inside, you want to go outside. If you're outside, you want to go inside. Like, yes. So uh, can you talk about this, this idea of paradox in, in what you presented? Well, I can only talk about it in reference to what yeah. I've said, and it seems to me a paradox in this sense that on the face of it, we'll always say that, yeah, inside we understand what is inside, we understand what is outside. So it's quite clear that these two things mean two different things. But as we we'll try to kind of look into it, as we try to experience it in that way, we come across so many instances where as I initially said, they interpenetrate, and then I said that they are interchangeable, and then I said that it brings us to a point where there is a, it brings us to a representational question. That is there something that, in, for example, between subjective and objective is another way to put that, you know. So is there an objective objective, which is separate from the subjective, or is every objective always a subjective point of view, you know? And even if it is not a personal subjective point of view, it is always a point of view from within a language, whether it be a scientific language or a literary language or a painterly language. So the question is whether you ever get out of that language. I believe you do, but not in the sense that you can claim to be closer to reality, you know? You can give. Anyway, that's, that gets us into a kind of uh, scientific discussion kind of area. But that is the paradox in that sense when I said the impossible object thing, you know, that the two are always like within each other and difficult to separate. But we always will use the two terms. So, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, my question is somewhat related to this thing of representation. Hmm. Sudhir, you are a great draftsman. You can paint a photorealist picture. So you must have had this struggle all your life, all your artistic life on how to escape from photorealism, I imagine. And the way I see it that you've done it is in terms of scale. You know, the earlier, some of the figures that you painted, the man looking out of the window, for instance, he has a very destabilizing, I mean, to the view, proportion. It's kind of um, shortened vertically, you know. Mm. And the, the balcony, the building outside seems very well proportioned. So similarly, 
I mean, was this a way in many of your paintings, one of the ways in which you kind of destabilize that realism to get to, to, to the real subjective, objective reality, let us say. You know, the real situation comes because you present a dilemma by tinkering with, with the real picture, in a sense. So this and other ways that you, or you, that you destabilize a bit, you know, it makes you disturbed looking at the image. If not disturbed in the, in the sense of being um, unhappy, hmm. but being uh, provoked to see the picture more. I mean, even yes. here, the women uh, are, seem so close up, close up to you, you know, so you, and the distance is, is really a distance, you know, it is, it is disproportionate in a way, disproportionate in the camera sense, in the way the mm, camera yes, lens yes. Uh, would take it. Absolutely, yeah. So you are doing it with your lens, which is, yes. a, which is a different lens altogether, yes. let's say it's, it's an, it is the artistic lens. So, well, I, I don't know if this is a comment or a question, but would you yes. like to say a little more yeah. on this? No, I agree with you that there is definitely uh, a moving away from what one might call photographic realism. But I, I was never really attracted to doing it photographically because my experience was never in that state. My experience was never photographic in the sense. Uh, and if I was standing at, this, at a street corner and and waiting for someone. And if that someone, uh, I, I saw such, that someone coming from a distance, that moment of recognition that, oh, there's that person who's coming, and I wave to him or whatever. That experience could never have been caught if I had taken a photograph in which that person would probably be, you know, one hundredth of the size of the scale of the photograph itself. It's my recognition that gave him you know, that made him prominent to me. Among so many faces, I recognize that face. So that is my experience. So I have to bring that to painting, rather than painting it exactly how large she would be down the road and how large all these other people who are around, whom I don't know, would be down the road. So that's one of the ways, you know, but you're very right that ultimately it is, or when there are three people in a room, or four people, or whatever, you know. I don't experience them as four people in a neutral space. I experience them as four people with their own space. You know, they're making a demand on the space. Each one is making a demand. Each one is kind of with a space. And that is coming into friction. It might, it might come into conflict, but, or it may not come into conflict. But there are these people who are adjusting within that space. They're adjusting their own spaces within that space. So that would distort the room itself. Distort in the sense, distort it from a photographic point of view, you know, because things would have to change. That's the kind of, yeah. There's one question there, I think, first. Okay. Hi. Um, so I wanted to go back to something you said at the start where you were talking about spaces becoming a little more exclusive and compartmentalized in the city. And um, in your paintings, there's a real diversity in terms of socioeconomic groups that you're representing. Uh, but I'm curious to hear when you show your work, I mean, I look around this room, it's not as diverse in terms of what I actually see in your work. And there's definitely like an inside outside there as well, who gets to experience the work that you're talking about. Um, so I wanted to hear a little bit about how are you able to um, sort of break that inside outside when people experience your work? Are you able to take it to an audience that's as wide as what you represent? And also, do you feel like um, physical spaces and having inside physical spaces are more a prerogative of the privileged as opposed to, because in this city, you, you, a lot of us are able to look inside certain homes because they're right there on the street, versus if I wanted to close off my space, I could, right? So do you see that shift in the city of where physical spaces and that exclusivity are more the prerogative of the pri privileged? Take up the first question, uh, the second question first. I don't think uh, spaces uh, belong to privileged people. Uh, so in that sense, a gallery, you're talking as a painter, a gallery with proper lighting and proper nice walls, white cube, is a space as much uh, the, the right 
of the person in the street as the privileged. It should be, you know. It's not that because, and the next point about this is, therefore, it's not that I need to show my works on the street only to reach these people, you know. I need to get them into the gallery. That's point number one. But secondly, one does make an attempt to take the work outside. And one has done that throughout one's career. One has tried to show it in schools, in factory sheds, in various places around Thana, and not only one work, at uh, one's own work. At a certain point, one realizes that it's not only your work uh, that is about these people. They need to read this work in the context of what is happening in the art scene itself. So there may be abstract artists, there may be other artists, there may be other artists who are tackling. So all their work, your, my work is part of the context of this context. So I need to take all that. So we did a project where we took uh, 45 works by 30 artists around eight cities in Maharashtra about eight years back now. So one has made those attempts to enlarge the audience, you know. It's not always as obvious or successful, but one, as an individual, one does that. You know? And I think it's good that more and more people are doing that. More and more people are conscious of doing this, except that uh, I have a slight objection, to, not objection, but I have a slight problem when people think that to do this, it has to be public, uh, you know, it has to be work in public spaces. Public spaces can take one kind of work. It demands one kind of work. That does not mean that some private statement about you and your wife or some private statement about family cannot be relevant or cannot be understood by the man in the street. You know? So he has a right to that too, apart from political intervention, apart from public works. So that's, I don't know if that, this is generally, <laughs> yeah. Sir, uh, I would like to know about your, the, the climate of the, your paintings. I find always it is very bright, sunny. When we talk about this city, uh, it, the cloud, rain and water is part of this city. And when we talk about inside and outside, the inside is always hollow and uh, empty. And outside, many, many, most of the time it is full of uh, raindrops and water and all. So I would like to know what you think about the your climate of your paintings. Firstly, I think that is a, a certain reading. I'm happy that you pointed. That is the way you responded to it. Uh, to me, I, I would say that I've, whatever I've experienced, I have tried to paint. So in Thana, for example, when we moved there, one did experience bright, sunny, open spaces, and one tried to experience and paint that. One was, when one was staying in Girgao, one did see you know, the other end. Rain, well, rain is very difficult to paint convincingly, so one has not done that. <laughs> <laughs> so, maybe. But I have painted floods. We were affected when staying in Thana by flooding. This was in, I mean, every 10 years Bombay gets a deluge. Now it's happening more often. But, in Tana, when we were staying on the ground floor, we had flooding, we lost a lot of things, and that led to a series of works about flooding, about, you know, so, there is a water in my work too, <laughs> not here. <laughs> so, uh, this is just an observation on the gentleman who was talking about the paradox. Um, what I noticed here is the same thing which I've seen over and over again. When I was younger, the idea of going outside would mean taking a cycle and going up Parvati Hill. I, I, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing quite clearly. Could you? Okay. I'm saying that I, I wanted to talk about the paradox. Yeah. The paradox is that when I was younger, I'm from Pune, yes. and when we had to go outside, it would mean that we would cycle up Parvati Hill or we would go for a walk in the university. Now, when I talk about going outside, I go into a restaurant <laughs> or I go into a cinema hall or I go into a mall. <laughs> which has yeah. got an AC, which is huge. Yeah. So it, there's this paradox of outside, inside, I think. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. So then I have one okay. question for you. Because when we were chatting before the Mumbai local sessions, 
you had said something very interesting about how your own ex your own li changing life experience of the city also mm. affected the way your paintings, the what you were looking at, changed. Could you share? I mean, could you tell us how you moved? In a sense, you personally moved from the, uh, painting the city outside to, to the inside. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I think there has definitely been a gradual shift from painting the city, uh, painting streets and the city from the outside as such, to painting interiors, to painting family and things like that. Uh, I think one of the reasons is in fact the way in which the city has changed. The same thing that the lady here said that is the city getting more oppressive, is the city getting more difficult to get around and this is definitely happening. I mean even if I was 24, 30 years old today, I would find it more difficult to travel around in the local train system than I did in 75. In 75, I could do a lot of reading. I could do sketching in the, train. in the train. For four years, I did so much sketching in the train, which is the basis of a lot of my later work. So things have changed. That is just one aspect of it. The second aspect that I said was this kind of uh, gated, gated kind of growth of gated communities, where it seems like, OK, this area is not you can't just walk through here, you know. There's some chokidar is going to swear, kaha jana hai, ye wo. Which didn't seem to happen earlier. You know, what one could go with no intention other than just experiencing the city in all its splendors and all its whatever, you know. So that is another thing that has changed. So this definitely has led to certain withdrawal. And the second element is one's own personal age. You know, it's obviously more difficult for one to kind of run and catch a bus and, you know, or whatever, or climb the local and go around the bridges and all that. So one gets a little distanced. One calls for an Uber, sits and goes off in 40 minutes to Thana. So it's not the same thing. One is losing out on a lot of things, but it's in inevitable, unfortunately, in some sense, you know. So those are some of the, some of the ways. I don't know about any deeper kind of uh, thing in that. <laughs> I, and I have one more question. Uh, yeah. We talked about, you, people have been talking about perspective in your paintings. Yes. But uh, two things that I've always, uh, that, that strike me is how even when you have a lot of people in your paintings, <clears throat> each, each person seems to be uh, alone or I don't know, have a space of their own. I don't know how else to mm. put it. Mm. You know, I don't mean alone as in lonely, but I yes. mean that, yes. and it could be a very populated painting or it could be a painting with just one person in one room or one person in another room. Mm. Um, and, and I don't know, I would just love to hear what you have to say about that, if there is something to say about that. And also if you have any thoughts about how you work with time in your paintings, because I feel, I don't know, your paintings make me feel some, like when I'm what, seeing your painting, I feel time differently. Time? I feel time differently. Like I, I even even your paintings that have a lot of dynamism in them, there's still like a, I don't know, like a stillness of time or something that happens. And I, I was just wondering if you would have something to say about. I'd be interested to know how you think about it, or does it just happen, or what perspective comes into that? I think I'm, in a sense, uh, my aesthetic development or whatever has led me to believe in a certain kind of experience as appropriate for a work of art. And that is uh, that you, you experience a complex uh, kind of, uh, maybe it's a narrative, maybe it's uh, a complex situation with many figures, etc., etc., etc. But ultimately, the final experience of this work must be uh, uh, that you, you can say that this, at this, so time becomes then, at that moment, you feel it all, you know. So that's a kind of view which uh, is different in different traditions. You know, there are traditions in which the narration is actually a cinematic kind of thing where there are putt paintings or people who show one by 
uh, one image after another and narrate a story. So their time flows in a different way. Here there is a kind of, uh, I think it comes from a kind of modernist aesthetic of a certain kind. Uh, it can be challenged, but that is what I feel my paintings aspire to, that you get an experience of the work. You might see it many times, you might, you might go and enjoy the small figures and all that and all that, but ultimately it must come to you as a whole at a moment. So that is... <laughs> Hi. Yeah. My uh, question is about one space, revolves around one yeah. specific painting of yours, uh, titled Street Corner. I guess you did it in the 80s. Early 80s. Yeah. Early 80s. Uh, and the work that you showed uh, uh, from early 70s and early 80s is all about uh, an artist walking in the street and around surrounding and what he experienced uh, through those images, visual yes. images. And your work is about city and its people. And then the later 80s work has reflection uh, and influence of how things happen. Ref someone's life is reflected by someone else's uh, presence uh, around, like uh, Studio Ghost, your hmm. work about Studio Ghost is one of example, and Compass, one of the recent examples hmm. can be. But now uh, the city and the society is completely changed. What I mean by that is post-internet world. Hmm. Uh, we all have smartphones, we all have internet access, we can Google things, we can know things quickly. Uh, book reading in the institutes are less now. Uh, when I see younger students in colleges, when mm. I go to visit, I see a lot of younger students reading less than... Yes. So how you see yourself when, uh, like Street Corner, you spun that specific way. So influenced by like, it gives me a feel that you were walking by and you seen these things and it reflected you in a certain way and then you try to represent in that painting. Yes. But when, as an artist, how you, self, you see yourself in post-internet world? Yeah. Well, as I said, uh, there are certain things that you, that are part of your growth. And, for example, a dependence on actual experience, a dependence on sensuous experience, you have felt, seen, smelt certain things is more important for me than a kind of knowledge that I can get by Googling something, you know? Now this may be again, as I say, this may be a gener generational thing, but I would rather depend on my sensuous and, uh, you know, actual experience to make a work of art than to depend on knowledge of that kind. It's very useful, obviously, I'll make use of it in different ways. I'll make use of other kinds of technologies, I'll make use of Photoshop, I'll make use of all that. All that is there, but internet, in that sense, I'll make use of, I mean, email, whatever. But as far as my work is concerned, I do not see that it will necessarily be affected, you know, by that. This may mean that the work does not become contemporary in the sense in which, for example, someone is using the internet to make artwork or someone is using, it may not become contemporary in that sense. But I believe that because I will hold on to what is real for me, it will make more sense for me and for the viewer than if I attempt something, you know, which I am not attracted to in that sense for, for making art. So if that... Yes. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, in the future, what is your plan? What else? Will you continue this <laughs> or you will? <laughs> I'm going to make work based on internet. I think I'll just continue painting and drawing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not from Mumbai, uh, but I'm wondering whether, this, though the concept of inside outside and this business of shutting yourself away or wanting to get out universal, would this kind of painting or this series of paintings be possible in any other city like Bangalore or Chennai or Pune, for example? Or is it 
very characteristic of uh, Mumbai, the divide between the inside and the outside. I, I don't think it's characteristic necessarily of Mumbai, though the exact way in which this becomes. It's like interpenetration. The interpenetration. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's not. Uh, but I have made a painting of Pune, which is up in the recent exhibition. Pune has changed also so much. Yeah, Pune has. All our cities are undergoing change. Every city is undergoing change. So uh, this specific, I mean, this this particular. Of course, people in Mumbai identify this exactly. This is Mumbai, and that is why they like or they appreciate this. But when these paintings are shown elsewhere, people do respond. They do bring their own experience of their own cities, you know, which doesn't mean that they feel that their city looks like Mumbai, but they feel that whatever experience is here is also uh, their own experience. You know? So I don't think it's necessarily specific in that way. I don't see myself uh, imagining this situation in Bangalore. I live in Bangalore. Okay. So I can't imagine people, uh, because here everybody is so close, you know, people live in such close proximity with each other, and there's always this sort of interaction between the two, the inside and the outside. It doesn't yes. happen so much in Bangalore. Yes, but I'm so sure there would be, a, if, if there's an artist in ba Bangalore who wants to do this, he would probably bring the exact uh, feeling that the Bangalore interaction between people has, you know, he would. So, to give you just a small example, you know, Mumbai has featured as a character in so much fiction, in so much literature, but strangely, Bangalore has never been in English. The but no, 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 this is the fact. Yeah, yeah, but in English literature. But I think if you look at if you look at if you look at Pranada literature or whatever, I think mm -hmm. even that's Bangalore true. Literature. Maybe there's the opposite thought also one has to give, that Mumbai has been constructed, the idea of Mumbai has been constructed into an iconic idea more than any other city has been constructed. Okay. Calcutta to some extent, yes. yes. And so that affects all of us, even from Mumbai and from outside. That we see, yes, yeah, Mumbai, Kar, Mumbai, you know, this is us. So we, we, we infuse that idea with something. Yeah, so maybe that's the opposite end of it. Yeah. That's probably the yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's also the age of the city, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. It's not. No, it's not. As a city that's a city, as 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 a Okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think uh, there was one painting where you showed, uh, you yeah. were showing the sinister influences from outside. Yes. Uh, I would uh, like to extend this internet thing into something like that. Internet brings that lot of influences inside. So inside, outside, uh, tinkering might, uh, uh, can be probably depicted very well with internet uh, context. Uh, so not using internet to picture or something, but internet itself becomes a platform where, you know, the inside outside gets uh, blurred in the, you know, subject object gets blurred and so on. Besides that, I was just thinking whether uh, you would think of, let's say, other public spaces like hospitals or schools where inside outside world uh, might have attractive contradiction. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, that's not a question, right? <laughs> Have I thought All of... All of your paintings are about family or individuals or students yes. or something. So, yes. inside a hospital and outside hospital, there's a world of difference. That's true. You know, children are learning, but yeah. there's a lot of fantasy happening in their mind. That's true. If there are other public spaces, then it, it could. might be not Bombay or Bangalore, but a universal. You're quite right. You're quite right, yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> Sorry to pop out like that, but uh, we would like to thank Sudhirji for this wonderful number of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sudhirji. And uh, just, I'll just take two minutes of your time and not to give you wrong information, I have a piece of paper with the right information in my hand. So, the next Mumbai local session is on the 13th of October at Kitab Khana Church Gate, uh, where journalist and filmmaker Bashaka Datta is going to talk about good art and good politics. On the 4th of November at M Cube Library, we have writer, novelist and playwright Shanta Gokhale who's going to talk about shaping a story. And um, on the 12th of November, at right here, at Bauda Jilad, we have uh, acclaimed Thumri singer, Dhanashri Pandit Rai. She'll be talking about ragas. She'll be talking about ragas. So, please spread the word and make sure your, uh, you've written your uh, email address on our mailing list and spread the word. And we're on Facebook, we're live with our sessions, so share these sessions and keep on coming. Thank you.